Wednesday, April 3rd. This is the second half of the Leadership Council budget workshop for the school board. Um, and please have the attendance. Yes. Uh, Leanne Casalonis? Here. Uh, Alicia Gibbons? Here. April. Here. Here. Sarah Layton? Here. Luke Hill? Here. And uh, Dylan Here. Can you please join me with the yeah, Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge with you to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Sure, did we have any other check-ins? Everybody's good? Ready? Okay. Um, so the feedback generally was really positive from the exit slip yesterday. We asked three questions. What was your key takeaway from today? What do you still need to know? And then there was the option for other comments. Um, so I'll just highlight a few. There were several comments that spoke to um, funding our facilities adequately and that the time has come to uh, no longer continue the practice of underfunding our facilities. I think that was based on some of the data and evidence that Todd provided. Um, another comments were that the board had good questions, all presentations were on time, were time just right, um, that the breaks were helpful to keep people fresh and moving and ready for the next step. Um, Here's one that I really liked. The district is remarkable at doing so much with so little funding. It's obvious that there's a paramount need for more funding, but there's also a great amount of care towards our students. Um, covered most of the questions. Tune in tomorrow for more questions. The budget is made up of so many competing priorities with no clear number one priority. Um, I think that really speaks to the scope of work that we have in, in public schools, um, and then obviously specifically to our district. Um, how much value is Scarborough getting for its return on their investment was another question that was asked, and this is something we're always trying to quantify and measure, um, and you'll see that throughout the budget book with some of the did you know facts and then connecting it to the research and things. Um, very appreciative for the organization and the facilitation of the workshop. Thought that it was good to keep us on track. So many wonderful people put a lot of effort into this workshop. Kate is the boss, I think that says. <laughs> um, great budget book, great energy in the room. There are so many ener energetic people in our district who are working really hard and responsibly to create a budget to support our students. Presenters did a great job. Um, and that's kind of the theme that went through <coughs> the presentation was articulate, that it was concise, and that you liked hearing a lot of different voices. And so nothing that made us think we needed to dramatically change our approach today, um, but we did adjust the agenda a little bit based on the content that we know you need to hear today. So thank you for that feedback. We'll type all of this up, and it'll be included as part of our notes. 
And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Allison Marchese, our Director of Special Services, who will get right into the heart of Special Services budget this year. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Hi. Hello. I want you to go and respond to <laughs> um, All right, let's keep with the positive energy and excitement. Uh, so special services, return on investments, celebrating in successes, um, and fast facts, uh, refer to the budget book, page 44 to 49, add to those pages. Um, I think there's no amount of time I have that I could uh, adequately address our successes and uh, the information we have to share, so please refer uh, to the budget book for more information. We did have two positions last year in regards to return on investments that we brought into the district. One was a transition specialist. Uh, IEPs beginning in grade nine in special education require uh, another component called a transition service plan. And this is very detailed uh, activities and services for preparing the student when they graduate in career, education, uh, independent living skills um, and work. So this specialist has worked with every single individual, uh, met with every single individual junior and senior. They have done many presentations to small groups of students. They've conducted career inventories. They've shared resources with case manager. It's been an invaluable uh, resource for really looking at the individual needs of students and supporting them better um, as they transition out of high school. We also uh, brought on a part-time middle school behavioral specialist. Prior to that, we had one uh, behavioral specialist to serve grades three through eight, an impossible task. Um, so. That has been um, very much a benefit uh, as of the middle of December um, when this budget was initially done. Over close to 100 observations had been conducted. 27 students were getting highly individualized programming. Um, nine positive behavior plans and functional behavioral assessments have been conducted. Uh, the person conduct, uh, consults weekly to all of our special education programs as well as works with uh, general ed in the um, RTI process and supporting uh, students in the uh, general ed setting. In regards to celebrating success, I can't speak enough about the wonderful support from Scarborough businesses. Um, and uh, we have a program at the high school that's called uh, Education for Employment, where weekly students go out and have supported job experiences. Uh, and uh, it's a great partnership, and we have several students that have been hired. So um, it's working, it's, and it's fantastic to see our kids thrive. We have conduct a lot of specialized trainings. We've really focused on giving our ed techs more specialized training this year, specifically in uh, reading and behavior management. They are on the front lines with our kids every day, and uh, that, that's an area we, we really wanted to focus on with them. Um, we, our behavioral specialists also uh, did a parent workshop entitled, When There's a Will in Your Way. And uh, this was modeled after uh, the programming that we were sharing with our ed techs as well. And so we, we got some nice response. I think someone um, on the board even attended for us, which was great to see. Uh, in addition, we our Wentworth Functional Life Skills Program was up and running because we had students moving up from K2, and that program is thriving. If you walk down the hall any day, you will see the equipment, the smiles, uh, with friends in the classroom with them. Um, it, it's, been a, it's been a great process. Uh, fast facts. Uh, I think the biggest fact is understanding that Scarborough has over 20% of students that are currently identified as having a disability uh, and that are receiving services through Section 504 or special education, 20%. So um, the, in special education, we are at a 14% um, identification rate, which is consistent with where we were last year. 
The state average is currently 18%, and it's uh, gradually on the increase. But I will say our 14% is mighty. You know, they are very complex. Uh, the needs are changing, even though the percentage isn't necessarily changing, the quality of the students' needs are changing. Uh, excited uh, that we represent 24 languages in Scarborough and really um, like to celebrate the other cultures in the students. And I look over at Ian Lovejoy because we have a, a heavier population at Eight Corners and it's just great to see, to see all those kids and to see the bulletin boards and their families come in and share some of their traditions and as we share our traditions. Um, the Gifted and Talented Program, we um, are vibrant in the academic area as well as the visual and performing arts. The uh, requirement uh, that the state has set is up to 5% uh, <coughs> of students can be identified. Uh, we are about that for academics and about 4% for uh, the visual and performing arts. Uh, so we continue uh, to focus on enhancing those services as well for students. Um, let's see. Fast pack. We have a lot of incoming kindergarten students coming that have already been identified uh, as students with IEPs. It's the highest number we have ever had. In December, it was 31 students. We are up to 34 with four referrals, still outstanding. Um, and the and that will be reflected in what our budget needs are um, this year. Uh, again, more fastbacks, successes included in the budget book. So our requests um, are based on really um, what we need for compliance regulatory compliance, but most importantly, to meet the needs of our identified students. Um, as I mentioned, uh, of the known 34 incoming uh, special education students for kindergarten, 19 or 20 of them live at the, in the Eight Corners school area. Um, we are beginning our IEP meetings for all these <coughs> little ones beginning Monday and mid-April will be wrapped up. Our numbers should be more stable at that time, uh, knowing who's coming, who's not coming, who uh, of, of those, all right, I could talk a lot about that, so I, I know I don't want <coughs> Kathy to tell me my time's up. Um, <laughs> uh, so, Eight Corners is going to be receiving 15 more special education students than they currently have now. And for that reason only, and specifically, we need another special education teacher for that building. Um, we, as I talked about, our behavioral specialist is currently four days a week, and we'd like to uh, have that service be available regularly every day, Monday through Friday. Uh, so there is consistency and availability. We are also proposing a shared position with the high school uh, with a social worker in Scarborough. Our social worker model is a shared position, half special education uh, in 504 and half building. Um, the uh, last year we had 123 students at the high school that were chronically considered chronically absent, which means at least 10, they were missing at least 10% of their school day. Uh, the issue of school avoidance, anxiety um, is impacting us and we have a requirement to do what we need to to engage those students in school as well as determine if it's actually a disability that's creating this absenteeism. Um, also, uh, the students shared in a forum that the anxiety they're under, the stress, the resources are very limited for them. And, and so for a multitude of reasons, um, Principal Ketch and I went in on this initiative together. Um, 
educational technicians. It's a huge request. We have 10 identified students of incoming CDS students uh, who have adult support, seven of them with IEPs for one-on-one -on -one adult support. Uh, we are, um, Chris and I are currently looking K-12. We look at how we can cluster, place <coughs> students together, how we can share adult supports, how we document the level of adult support needed, if it's medical, behavioral, or academic. Um, but the reality we're facing right now is we have 10 incoming CDS students. And we only have one student graduating who has adult support, so it's only freeing up one uh, current slot for us. Uh, the K-8 clerical position, um, this really comes directly from teacher voice. It was their number one need um, shared with us uh, when we went to them about budget, budget needs. Uh, we, in special education, there it is all about timelines and regulations. How many days before you get the notice of the meeting? How many days after you get the minutes of the meeting out? How many days you have to do an evaluation and get reports out? It, um, th these clerical pieces take up a significant amount of time for our professional staff in calling parents, outside providers, uh, school staff to coordinate a meeting time can be, as you can imagine, very complex. Uh, we have put in for a position, which I think uh, Kate costed out at $45,000. I am right now piloting a model that hopefully can reduce this to actually not a new person and not a new position, but integrating um, our clerical support staff at the different K through five buildings and paying them up to five additional hours per week as needed. Uh, so we are piloting that at Wentworth School right now, and we'll be rolling that out before the end of the year at the middle school, and we've targeted K-2 to begin in the fall because um, the consulting teacher at K-2 manages all of the CDS paperwork, so it's less of a, of a need at this point. Uh, And lastly, um, so this is a difficult slide to speak to. Uh, unmet needs certainly does not mean it's not a critical need. Um, prior to us knowing the impact of uh, the incoming CDS group of students, uh, continuing our work around inclusion was the, a significant priority for us. And when I view inclusion, I don't, I don't think in terms of only special education. I think of inclusion as let's look at people's similarities, not differences. Let's look at how are we authentically connected. How do, do we feel that we're authentically part of this group? Presumed competence for everyone. So to me, that's not a question about disability. That's a question about individuals. But within the lens of special education, it does take on a more complex layer of how do you um, address the curriculum so that students can feel that way in their general ed setting. So uh, an inclusion specialist would work with the general ed teachers on how to differentiate that curriculum it goes hand in hand with the universal design for learning. The premise being um, everyone can learn, but we learn differently. So what tools do I need to access the materials? How can I show you what I know? And how do I understand why it's important to me? So I feel that these positions benefit each and every student, whether you have a disability, regardless. It's a benefit for all. So. As Julie said earlier, there, there are competing needs. They're all critical, but we can't bring everything on board. In regards to unexpected costs, um, so we have a new situation that's come about that has always been possible. Uh, main care billing is only allowed 
if parents give consent. In Scarborough, we do not do main care billing because of that reason um, and the complexities of it and the liability of it. But our private purpose schools rely on a significant amount of their costs through main care billing and they receive consent from the parents and they do it. Uh, if a parent refuses, then all those costs become the school's responsibility. If the parent's personal insurance is being tapped, they will sometimes remove main care consent because main care will go after private insurance first. Uh, or a parent's main care can lapse and it's reviewed and billed on a monthly basis, so sometimes there's a lapse in service. All of these costs are ultimately always the responsibility of the public school. Um, we have all of those situations occurring right now uh, with our students. And this could be as little as a zero impact to over $300,000. It's, it's a significant, uh, significant amount. I can certainly get into the complexities of main care in more detail uh, at another time. Uh, and then uh, new students. I always say we're a phone call away. We're a phone call away from a parent moving to Scarborough with a student who has a one-on-one -on -one adult support person with them. That's a $45,000 impact. We have no control over who moves in and what, what their needs are. Um, of course, it works the other way, too, if we have a student move out and uh, they have that adult support, but we don't have that happening as much. And lastly, I just want to put on the horizon, um, there has been a lot of discussion in Augusta about public schools taking over special education for three to five-year-olds. That um, has not passed yet. There have been many proposals. Uh, it is extremely unlikely that anything will pass for this September. Uh, it is, so I, I put that out there. It is something in the future we will need to deal with as a district and that will also impact facilities. Uh, but there's a lot to be worked out on that. Um, so I'm just doing a little foreshadowing there. I think that's it. Take a moment and just jot your questions, any wondering that you're having for um, Chris and Allison as we pass it over to our primary school principals, starting with Kelly Mullen Martin. We certainly have a lot to celebrate at K2. Um, all those smiling faces, number one. Um, the first bullet is a fast fact um, to take a look at what we're preparing all of our students for and that our incoming kindergartners are preparing them for the workplace of 2032 and beyond. So that's, just wrap your mind around that for a moment. Um, and that we're preparing them for jobs that we don't even know what they are yet. And so as stewards of our budget in the community, I think it's um, one of your challenges to help folks understand what education is today and why it costs so much and why that's so different and that's one of the reasons why. It's not like it was um, when folks went to school. Um, so that being said, um, we have benefited greatly from the uh, investments that we made last year, which were mostly in staff. Um, we added staff to Blue Point and Pleasant Hill in the in form of teachers due to increasing enrollment. Um, and uh, as well as replacing staff that had retired. So, um, we had almost half 
of the staff at Pleasant Hill were new staff this year, um, including the principal. <laughs> and um, the principal role also was not shared as an instructional strategist, so that was also great that she's completely dedicated as the building principal. So um, that allows us to do all the wonderful things that we want to do with our students. All of the you know, rich information that's in your budget book about how well kids are doing, um, that's all through our staff. As we said, our students and our staff are our greatest resource, and that's where we want to put our investments first, is with them. Um, let's see. Also, another investment that we made mid-year at, Pleasant, at uh, Blue Point was the kindergarten ed tech, because we did not add a teacher at Blue Point. Um, we added two teachers, but not a third. Um, and our kindergarten numbers were riding right on the edge, and there were still some needs there. So in January, we invested some money that we had due to breakage to just add a little extra pair of hands and a building ed tech that would be dedicated just to kindergarten. And it um, is a model that we're piloting to see, is that something that would work? When we get in that situation and we can't add a teacher, how is that, is that a viable option? So we're you know keeping data on that and seeing how that works, and so we'll have that information for the future. Um, let's see, at Eight Corners, they've piloted the school-wide information system, or SWISS, um, which allows them to track you know, behavioral information all over the school in all environments of the school. Um, so whatever students are up to, um, all of those great little things that they do, <laughs> uh, so that they can really identify patterns. You know, where are we having issues? Is it on the playground? Is it in the cafeteria? Is it in the hallway? And where do we really need to focus our interventions as a building team to help our students be successful? And our approach is always instructional. It's not punitive. So where do we need to provide better modeling and better instruction for students? And even if it's more individualized for a student, you know, one particular student is having um, difficulty, how can we help? intervene with that particular student. Um, social emotional learning is something that we're doing all the time in our K K2 schools. And we have a lot of different um, programs uh, in place. Mindful schools is a big focus of ours, zones of regulation. Um, we have good old Kelso that some of you may remember. <laughs> He's been around for a long time. Um, and it's, I know, right? It's, it's really, if you've looked at any of the research recently, it's, it's got to become a primary focus. And um, so we have a K-5 team that we've put together, and Jessica is the chair of that, that will be looking at um, really pulling those pieces together and looking forward at how do we maximize those resources and really pull together a, a you know, clearly articulated plan of what we really need to do um, to, to make that a cohesive um, plan for teachers so that they have the tools they need to provide that for students. So that's a little bit about K2. Okay, I'm going to share with you, I'm going to let you press button. Yeah, I'll press um, just one button. Um, that this budget allows um, K2, this is a phase level budget for us, um, and truly our K2 requests are just to meet school-wide enrollment projections. So um, just as a little comparison about what we're looking at on this date, April 3rd of 2018, um, we had 178 kindergarten students that were pre-registered to come walk through our doors this fall. We ended up with um, 209 students um, in our K2 buildings this year. Um, as of today, April 3rd, 2019, we have 218 uh, pre-registered kindergarten students. Um, so that's a difference of 40 that we're anticipating. Um, and as of today, we have 206 students who have walked through the door and given us their paperwork, and we've got their folders ready to go. So um, we are well on our way to meeting our pre-registration numbers and perhaps surpassing that um, maybe by spring break. Um, it 
could be because we completely rocked kindergarten <laughs> registration. <laughs> yeah. um, that's, that's probably it. it. That's we probably it, yeah. We're amazing. Wait to come meet us. Yeah, so that, that could be it, um, but we don't, uh, we don't know. No. <laughs> um, it's all Jessica. It is, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot at Pleasant Hill. I'm at Annie Corners. All right, so as you can imagine, when you add more students, um, that has a ripple effect on what else you need in your school. And so the other requests that we have are adding additional time to the Pleasant Hill art teacher position. She's currently a point four, which means she's there two days a week. So adding point two would allow her to come three days a week um, to make sure that all of our students um, got art. And uh, the other position that we would be requesting is that ed tech support. And that would be either at Blue Point or Pleasant Hill. Um, based on enrollment and what we needed and to make sure that it was equitable across buildings um, for what the classrooms and the general building needs are. Um, the final request um, from our phase level is the money that we need in order to make sure that those core classroom materials and supplies are in the room when the teacher arrives. Um, it's it's wonderful to budget for the teacher and the um, benefits and all of that, but they need the stuff when the kids come to. Um, and that was, uh, th that was something that was evident this year when we had a new teacher that um, that wasn't necessarily part of the thinking in last year's budget, but we made it work and um, she's rocking it. And we just don't wanna put anyone in that position again. So that money is in, in the budget for that for next year. All right, so unmet needs. Um, I think an important thing to remember is that at K2, we have maintained awesome programming for the last 17 years that I've been there, um, but it hasn't changed a whole lot. You know, we've offered PE twice a week, art, music, library once a week. Those are our specials. The school day hasn't changed significantly unless it's changed K-12. Um, we haven't added world languages or we haven't taken away anything. It's been a very steady, um, consistent program. Uh, what we have done is gone to all day kindergarten, which was wonderful many, many years ago now. Um, and what we are looking at is that we really need something different for our incoming kiddos to learn how to be in school. Those skills are just not there the way they need to be based on trauma, children's needs, all kinds of things, just the changing world that we live in. Um, so one of the unmet needs is something that we would like to, to try piloting at Eight Corners, which is the response to intervention teacher. This is a teacher who can help all those kiddos who are coming in who are not yet identified, may never get identified, but who really don't know how to be in a room with 20 kids and one adult, who don't know how to be with other peers their age who may not know how to use the bathroom by themselves or what it means to line up and go down the hall to someone else and to transition, um, what it means to share and to take their turns and to wait for an adult attention for something. It's just, it's unbelievable how many kiddos are just not having those skills from preschool, daycare, home situations for a variety of reasons and helping them acclimate to school so that they feel safe, so that they feel wanted, so that they feel supported, so they can learn those skills for jobs that we don't even know the names of yet in 2032, um, is, is our job. And, and it, takes, it takes more than just reading, writing, and, and math. So um, the social emotional piece that Kelly spoke to is, is a, a huge part of that, but somebody to help implement that is another piece of this. Um, asking teachers to carve out another 30 minute block a week for another special of social emotional learning is not what this is about. Um, this is about all day every day for kids to support them while we, in the, those really important times of year, the beginning of the year, transition times, whether it's winter time or back to spring. I mean, all of these things are big transitions for kiddos our age. And um, we really need some more help in doing that. And so, this is one of the unmet needs um, that we have. We also believe that we need more um, additional building ed tech support in general. You know, um, when there are 
going to be 17 more kiddos on IEPs in my building this year than there are next year than there are this year. That's at least 36 more meetings a year for IEPs for teachers. Those cannot all happen before or after school. Some of them happen during the day. We need people to help cover those meetings so that the learning continues and people who know the kids and know the curriculum and have our training and have our, our, um, our curriculum knowledge and expertise that's what keeps the learning going for everybody so that while that teacher's out at a meeting for, for a student for an IEP, that learning continues and the quality of education doesn't suffer. Um, substitutes are great, but you can't, you can't always get them and you can't always know that they're going to be able to continue the learning the way somebody who's a part of the staff can. Um, so that's, that's a part of um, an unmet need as well. And of course, didn't mean to terrify you all with our numbers. <laughs> of pre-registered kiddos, but this is why space is so important. And Todd talked about it yesterday, and we're going to keep talking about it, I know. But I, I keep doing the numbers and thinking, where are they all going to go? <laughs> um, so stick around. You know, for it's 6 o'clock tonight and 7 o'clock tonight. You'll see more information about how tight the space is, especially at eight corners. But Pleasant Hill is now growing faster than it ever has. And they're on the smallest footprint of all. So I, I don't know don't what you're going to do. Like, I, <laughs> I know, the yurt. I know, the, the inflatable classroom. We have all kinds of great ideas. But, um, you know, she's got 70 pre-registered <laughs> kindergartners. That's four classrooms. That's four kindergartens, four first grades next year, and three second grades. And the year after that, no, we don't know yet. But I don't know where art and music is going to happen. I don't know where those things are going to happen. I you know, our buildings are a little bit bigger footprint, but it's not going to stop after this year the need for space and the need for additional time uh, for art teacher, music teacher, that kind of thing. They just, they're so partially piecemealed out that it's hard to squeeze in. Oh, you just have to get two more classes in and meet everybody's needs. It's not going to work the way it is over the years to come. So just, that's my... <laughs> As you think about special services and you think about our primary school needs, are there questions that you have for the experts? I see Hillary, then Leanne, then Nick. I raise my hand. Thank, Thank you, you for raising your hand, Barry. Um, I have a question, a question for Allison, and it's a, it's a, I think it's going to be a, a two-part question. Um, in and I'm just thinking about in, in planning ahead for, you know, the future, the years to come. Do you feel like the number of high incoming special services students is due to an increase in that population? Or is it perhaps that, that, that we're intervening earlier? Or, um, or what? <laughs> we'll start with part one. I do think uh, more students are being identified in CDS, and I think that trend is growing. Um, we have been waiting for the numbers of our currently identified three and four-year-olds from the DOE so we can start looking ahead, mm -hmm. even though many referrals happen in that short timeline. But yes, I think the numbers will continue to increase. Okay. It's a combination of things, too, if I could add into that. We have to remember that we're, and I'm not making this assumption that this is our students particularly, but nationally, as a country, we're in the midst of an opioid crisis. And if we know that, Joanne has the numbers. One in five babies one are born drug addicted. Those children are likely to have developmental delays and require early intervention. Um, and so when you start to think about that, and again, I'm not saying that that's true about our incoming students necessarily, but overall we're seeing a rise in the needs um, in, in the need of special education services. Did you have a part two? No, I think that covered part two. I do have another question, but uh, you can come back to me. I have two of them. Um, one I wish Monique was here for. You identified the number of um, hearing loss students that we have. Have we considered having, in addition to our foreign language offerings, 
sign language courses. <laughs> we can answer that. I would love to have um, American Sign Language as one of our foreign um, language classes. I'm a huge proponent of it. We do have a teacher of the deaf employed in the district, but that is not the same as certified as an ASL teacher, but she does do some signing instruction with our functional life skills students on, you know, basic sign. So I'm with you on that. Put that in the unmet need. As a world. As a world. Well, as, um, as Ann said, uh, we have a lot of discussions going on right now about uh, K2 and special services, so I'm, I'm glad these two are linked together for a selfish reason. I've become a content expert in this, uh, as many of you know, uh, or at least trying. And so my question is one really of clarification, because I want to make, try and make this as clear as possible. For the people watching, the people around the table, and the people that will join us at 6, um, you talked about 20, I, I have it written here, 20 special ed students that have identified coming into eight corners. And you said that's 15 more at the school than are currently there. I'm assuming that means that five are exiting 20 and coming in, so a net gain of 15. Awesome. That was my question. Oh, I remember what my follow-up question was. Also for Allison, um, you talked about out-of-district placements and mentioned that main care was complicated, which is why we're not billing. Is that, if that is, is the reason why... Would it be more cost effective to hire somebody who specializes in that billing in order to recoup some of the upwards of $300,000 you mentioned? That's my question. Uh, let me clarify. When I said the unexpected um, potential may be up to 300, that we do not bill. Scarborough does not bill for the out of district students. The out of district schools do. So that's separate. In the past, Scarborough has billed for OT, speech, and PT. Uh, but as many schools got audited and had to pay significant fines, we're very hesitant because main care is a medical model and we're an educational facility. So two different components to main care. OK, thank you. There are consultants who do do that work, but when we look at the return on investment, it's not something that right now for Scarborough makes sense. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, no. That was for the out-of-district placements, given the cost associated with that, is there, is there an ability for Scarborough to meet some of those needs here if, if we get an investment in, in providing that service? Great question. I would say no. We have a very low percentage of students that go uh, to out-of-district uh, placements. Uh, really, our criteria is when a student's need requires two adults to a student, that that may exceed what we can safely manage and appropriately manage in a public school setting. And there are quite a few kids on the pending list that we, hence our behavioral uh, strategist positions are really significant in helping us develop plans to keep our kids with us. We want to keep our kids with us, uh, and we work hard to return our kids to their, their home school. Um, but the situations where kids are out, it really is due to significant aggressive behaviors and disruption of the educational environment for themselves and others. Allison, how many kids are currently out of the district? Six. Which is actually one of the highest numbers that we've had since I've been here. I think when I first came, we only had a couple of, like, two or three students who were placed out of district, and then we've had some move in. We've always, we've always been under 10. We used to have more students because we had a lot of group homes in Scarborough. Uh, so they were state agency clients, so we had more kids placed out, but the funding stream was different, and it wasn't on us for them. Uh, so we work hard to keep our kids home. I was wondering if we, um, so I saw, well, first of all, I saw that the response to intervention teacher as an unmet need was specific to eight corners. Is that right? Yeah. And then 
combined with the data that you're giving with the number of kids that are identified um, as being higher at eight corners for, for IEPs and, and special services needs, I was wondering if you collect data to try to determine um, just in general um, why kids need those services and then specifically um, geographically specific in our town, if, if there's a way to determine that. And I just wonder that sort of in general, but also as we plan for the con whether a consolidation or, or growth in, in the future for, for that huge group. I don't know if I can answer that exactly other than I think the growth in the town has been in my district, in the Eight Corners district primarily, so a lot of the um, multi-house complexes are coming in and that um, brings parents with young kids so that they come here. So I'm not sure that the response to intervention teacher was targeted for Eight Corners primarily because... Um, we, instead of asking for three teachers at once, that's a great deal of expense, but we thought we'd pilot it and try it in one place. I am the only Title I school as well, and I echo wishing Monique was here to help explain some of this, but um, our, our academic support program that is funded through Title I um, it can, it is tailored to what's written in the, in the grant, and that is specific now to math and reading. What I'd like to see is a broader student support model instead of academic support model. So because I don't have a locally funded academic support teacher the way the other two schools do, this was sort of my um, ying to that yang, and, and asking for that locally funded position that would be comparable to what they have so it could address broader needs of kiddos and not just that specific Title I math and literacy. The grant can be written a little bit broader. There is an other box, and we're exploring what that other box actually means on the Title I grant and how broadly <coughs> we can define that role. Because right now, her, the teacher's role is very narrowly defined based on, and so we, I, don't, I don't have a locally funded person that I can just say, oh, go help those kids. They need help. Go help them. Go ahead. It's okay. They have to be identified as needing support in math or literacy um, to get that support. So that was, it's not the same name, but it's the same flavor. It's just a broader opportunity for, for us to meet student needs, not just academic needs, if that makes sense. And then if the other schools, we find that successful, then, you know, we can replicate it, but we're not going to ask for $100,000. You know, it, three teachers is... $240,000, not, eight, you know, so it's just a much bigger ask. So let's try it in a place that has high needs right now and growth and, and the other limitations of Title I and, and then see what happens. Is that? So Title I is a federal grant and it's designed to supplement the work that the district is doing in service of lower socioeconomic populations. And so um, Ann School is a Title I school because of the, socio the, the percentage of students who are receiving free and or redu free or reduced lunch. Um, so that's part of it. And one of the important things to think about with the grant, the way you write it, you can be more flexible, but you have to be very clear that you're not supplanting which means funding something that should be locally funded through that federal grant, you can only be supplementing, which means adding on to. Yeah. Um, Allison, I have two questions, so I'll ask them both, and then we can trade the microphone over. Um, the first one is, is back to the main care. So you, you said up to $300,000 potentially under unexpected cost. Is that budgeted, though? Because I see that there's a light item for SPED outside placement. Is that what that's referring to? Or? Okay. It's not budgeted. Okay. Currently, in, in this round. So I have a follow-up question to that, but let me ask the other one first. The, um, you mentioned the three to five requirement for special services could be coming from the state um, potentially next year. Is that sort of bundled in the pre-care um, pre, pre K uh, law that could be coming. Uh, 
I think it's very unlikely that the three to five year old uh, CDS will be online for September since the state still hasn't attached a number to it to be heard. Uh, that is a different program than universal pre K. Okay. Universal pre K is for all CDSs that I'm referencing, is the special education side of it. Okay. So there's a chance that it, we could just have the CDS side of it and not the universal? Correct. Okay. Um, the unmet need uh, in regards to the main care, the follow-up question, you will see in the budget that we do uh, have a small line, what's called SEED, um, and because there we have a, you know, you could have a placement and you're only paying part of their main care. Uh, main care we still have to pay 38% of the main care costs. That's called seed. The rest of that money is withdrawn from our subsidy, and that's calculated on a quarterly basis. So uh, that figure is fairly stable, and that's why it's in the budget. Um, the out-of-district line is purely uh, the tuition. The state annually sets a day rate for each out-of-district program. For example, um, we have a program that's $241 a day. Uh, but the main care costs that they're also billing for is $383 a day. And so every day a child is in attendance, that's what the schools or main care can get billed for. So, thank you. This might be a one more minute in this section. I was I was waiting because I, I thought was, we were going to wait to get to K two, and I'm, all my questions are in K two. I have I have a question for Allison. Um, I. Actually, when you were talking about the transition coordinator, I, I got thinking about the career pathways program at the high school. And I wondered if, um, as those programs start to develop and, and do the great work they're doing, if you envision any overlap in that. So they share resources and uh, collaborate together to support the students um, with their transition needs through the career pathways program. And then my second question is about the inclusion specialist as an unmet need. I, I think that that is an incredible idea to get somebody that could help um, regular ed teachers um, provide the differentiated experiences that are so crucial for our students to really uh, meet their potential in the classroom. I wondered, um, in the absence of that position going through, considering it's an unmet need, if there's any opportunity for the instructional coaches in the building to do that work in part, and if there's time for them to do that work, because I would expect that they would be pretty qualified to help the teachers do that. In regards to the first question on the transition specialist, I definitely see that as a partnership. Uh, I know uh, that position has worked with uh, it has worked with Christina Zvaznik in regards to the internship. They've certainly uh, worked with Robin Larry in regards to college placement. We've um, even, we're looking at developing a culinary arts uh, program. So we're looking at uh, partnering with food service. Also this year we partnered with facilities and had, um, you know, a student was interested in a career in custodial uh, work, and so they did a work experience down at Wentworth. So always, they're, they're all our kids. We use all resources together. Uh, in regards to the inclusion specialist, we have for a few years been con uh, contracting out with a consultant to help us do that work with some individual student teams, as well as doing some school-wide uh, training, specifically at Wentworth and the middle school. Uh, our ICs have been very valuable. We do tap them as well as our behavioral specialists to support uh, students and the general ed teachers, and we will obviously continue to do that. 
we can agree to a five minute break, I think we could answer April's questions. Okay. 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 I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so this is a question for all of the building principals at the K2. Um, increased staffing makes up a large percentage of our new investments for the FY20 budget. And so if you could each let us know how many kindergarten, how many first grade, how many second classes, grade classes you have right now, and then what this additional staff member will be adding um, for next year. And then if you can speak just a little bit to what the um, class size numbers would look like if we're unable to meet um, these requests. like to find a spot in your budget book where you can see this information. It's oh, I right in the right. stu superintendent's intro. It shows the what if and what if not specific to K2, but then also at each of their phase levels they list it. And on page seven. Okay, thank you. So just on quickly, I have four sections of K1 and 2. Each. Like each. Four each. Four each. Currently. Currently. Okay. And my class sizes are... Um, 20 and under. I don't have any over 20 right now. Okay. Um, and next year, I'm anticipating five sections of kindergarten due to my already over 80 registered kiddos. So that other, if I didn't get that, then I would have kindergartens well over 20 with 19 of them with IEPs. So I currently have three Ks and four first and four second. And so I'd be, I'm right on the verge right now. If we added um, with what we have, we have 60 solid registrations right now, but more are coming in. So I'm anticipating needing a fourth K, which would put all of our class sizes next year with four, four, and four at about 16 and up. Thank you. So we currently have four kindergarten, three first grade, and three second grade. So as our kindergartners matriculate to first grade, if we kept three class, uh, we would have class sizes of 24 plus. Um, and our second grade will stay the same because we have a small first grade class. And our kindergarten sizes would stay what they are now because our kindergarten <coughs> enrollment looks around the same okay. if we maintain for kindergarten. And so that class size is um, currently at 18 and 19. So you're looking to add first grade? Right. First grade would be the, the bubble. Okay. Thank you. And depending um, where you look in the enrollment study, Eight Corners is projected to receive some more first graders as well, so there could be um, a potential to look more closely at that. Okay, thank you. No, I'm good. Okay. All right, so okay. now it's time for us to take a quick break. Um, we're going to come back together at 4.10 to keep us on track, so um, it's about 4.02 right now, so eight minutes to use the bathroom. There are snacks and drinks over here if you need anything. And of course, feel free to connect with someone who you haven't connected with yesterday.
Hello? So before we jump into the next phase level presentation, um, I played that song to try to get the mood a little light. But in all seriousness, um, these are the tough conversations that we have, right? Um, getting to this point where you're hearing what is in and what is not <coughs> in the budget is not an easy process. And I think that as much as we talk about it, it's hard for our community to fully understand the work that happens um, leading up to just the proposal. And then we know there's much more work to do. I jokingly um, have my red pen ready to hand it over to you as the school board, because now it's your turn to start to think about the priorities and um, what gets in the budget and what does not. And nothing about it, and I said this in a couple of emails last night that you may have seen, nothing about this feels good to us. Because we clearly, we're closest to the need, right? And we see it every day, but we also realize the other pressures that exist um, in terms of what is our community's capacity to support the needs of the schools. Um, and so, although it, it, it does, it gets sad quick, right, when you start to hear about what the unmet needs are because every one of them is justifiable. And so I will pass it over to Kelly Crosby, our principal at Wentworth, to talk yeah. about Wentworth. Should we do that? We'll do it. We can do it at the end. On that note, on that cheerful note. <laughs> 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 so, um, well, this is one of my favorite things to do, actually, is to talk about our return on investments and celebrate some successes and talk about fast facts. So the biggest success to celebrate this year is that um, last year, due to a de decline in enrollment at the middle school, and um, they did some shifting in their master schedule, we were able to, at no budget impact, no cost, shift a world language teacher to Wentworth School. And um, it's been Nikki Vafiatis, and she is a ball of energy and sunshine and light and positivity. And she has taken Wentworth School by storm, and it's been awesome. So um, though there's been no budget impact, there's been a huge student learning impact. And we're just so excited to have this back at Wentworth School. It's been a long time. It's been since the old school that we had um, world language. So um, this year, our third graders um, learned French and our fourth graders Spanish. And our fifth graders took both French and Spanish um, so that they're able to make a bit uh, to make an informed preference about their choice for world language at middle school. So this year the focus was on communication. They did, um, they learned greetings and basic expressions. Um, they learned some classroom vocabulary, numbers, colors, those sorts of things. Um, and just providing a positive experience so that they could grow and build confidence in their um, acquisition of a second and for some kids third language, which has been really exciting to learn. Um, in our school. And so this was not only a um, kind of a pullout experience for our students. Nikki was so excited to bring this to Wentworth that she's also been in many, many, many classrooms integrating this. You know, an example that I can think of is that a fourth grade class was learning about the um, monarch butterfly migration, and she was right in there teaching them all the language about um, how to say it in Spanish because they were headed to Mexico, and they did the maps and set up a whole um, section of the classroom and really just integrating that on the spot. I think that that's the post, the photo on the right-hand side. Um, so just a really, really ter terrific um, to have that back at Wentworth, um, and we're excited to just continue building on that. Um, I always will take every opportunity to celebrate that we continue to yield really huge um, returns on previous investments, aka our beautiful school facility. Um, and we are continuing to just grow that garden from just a blank canvas into this incredible learning lab really is um, where we are now with that. Um, some exciting things that are happening there and with some of our student leaders in the garden, um, we've been collecting composting data and really working hard to be good stewards of our earth in the cafeteria. And um, so once we really got so good at composting, the kids recognized, and I think that you're going to maybe hear about this a little bit at <coughs> the board meeting tonight, but the kids recognized that, well, we should really be recycling these milk cartons. And I won't, I won't steal anybody's thunder, but it's amazing the research that they've done and the people that they've interviewed, including Mr. Jepson, 
and Mr. Hinton, as they call him, <laughs> <laughs> because Dylan was really a leader in bringing silverware to our school instead of plasticware and reducing our garbage waste. So um, just so sweet. They interviewed our custodian. Um, anyway, so we're just, I think that the emphasis on the green features of our school have just, they just continue to... Um, build that that desire to be great citizens of the earth for our students so that's great um we've also started a new uh approach to integration with allied arts and um kathy terrell has been my principal intern this year and she's led this project but it's been really exciting to um think about how the allied arts teachers can use their expertise to support the um, core learning that is happening within um, each and every classroom. So that's been a really great um, new focus for us or refreshed focus for us. Um, and that we've continued with some courageous conversations around inclusion built on that um, foundation that we started with professional development for our entire school last year. Um, those three sessions of foundational work have really carried us through in that um, mission that we're supporting each and every student. Um, so just lots of great things. And then additionally, I always like to share that this year, once again, we've hosted over 500 meetings and events at Wentworth School. So all of that. April, I added that little cloud <coughs> on the bottom left just for you. Um, so all of this can be found yeah, on page 20 on, in our budget book. So those are some of our successes this year. Um, the FY20 budget allows us to uh, maintain our current programming and class sizes. So um, we are not yet experiencing that bubble. Although at last check, oh, thank you, Mr. Rohde. Um, although at last check, we've welcomed almost 60 new students to Wentworth this year. So not, um, not beginning of the year, but over the course of the year, almost 60 new kiddos. So that's, um, that's really great. Um, so we will be able to maintain our class sizes with this, with this budget um, using the projected um, enrollment. And we'll, we'll be able to continue um, really supporting really high levels of student learning. So there are fast facts on page 18 of the budget book. There are a few that I'm really extra proud of that 21% um, or more of our students are at proficiency, at or above proficiency in math than the state average on the MEA. Um, I think that's really outstanding that our grade five students have consistently outperformed the state average um, year by year, increase by 12 to 26% over the last eight years. Um, with last year, 80%, 87% of our kids were at or above proficiency um, in science uh, on the MEA, which is awesome. And some previous investments in our STEM programming, I think, has really supported that, um, that growth. So we have two full-time STEM teachers. Um, not over 99% of our students engage in a 50-minute STEM engineering course each week, every week, all year long at Wentworth. So um, really, really wonderful. Um, the second thing in that this budget will allow us to do is to respond to teacher voice by um, increasing a modest amount the Wentworth instructional supply line will continue to do our bulk ordering and be really fiscally responsible with what we're ordering for supplies and keeping it consistent, making sure we're getting the very best deal that we can on all of the consumable things that, kids, that we need to do the business of school. Um, but this, this um, new investment will allow some funding for teacher flexibility and autonomy for consumable instructional projects. Um, and so those, those photos that I included there are kind of some of those things, you know? We've done a great job over the years of um, recently, you know, really building classroom libraries and making sure that there's consistency in classrooms around those things. Um, that's part of our core curriculum. But Sometimes, te not sometimes, all the time, teachers always have these great ideas that really connect to maybe a current event or something that their students are interested in um, that they really want to bring forward. And so the bottom right hand side, so those flags, this was an international, flex um, international festival that the third grade students in the blue learning community put on. And um, they made those flags. Those are the countries that they research and represent. Those are really cute. But at the end, 
they were like waving a little American flag because the idea is like we come from many and we are one. And so I supported the purchase of these little 89 cent American flags for each of the kids. I cannot tell you how many thank yous I got. Mrs. Crosby, thank you so much for those flags. They're awesome. I was like, this, this is your teacher's idea. And so it's those things that kids are going to remember and they're, they're so meaningful for them. Um, other examples are there are teachers who want, like to do solar system projects or create a creature, adaptations, um, owl pellets, model mat, if you're into that sort of thing. <laughs> if you're, um, those sorts of things that are consumable and discretionary. And I think it really continues to keep the joy in learning in, in school. So um, modest investment that I think will go a really long way. And then... So this is the same drum that I've been beating for forever, I guess. But our biggest unmet need is time. <laughs> that um, we just need we just need more time. We need more professional learning time. Um, I, that's a list of all of our um, you know curriculum that is extremely rigorous. I was talking with a teacher today who is um, planning to retire next year and talking about her very long career and just saying. This is not the job that you signed up for nearly 40 years ago, right? Things are so different. Curriculum is more intense. Student needs are more complex. Um, we're expecting teachers to do more. Um, Julie has that really great list of all the things that have been added to schools, and we've not added one single minute. You know, we've not added one single minute yet. <laughs> we're just like, keep adding on um, expectations, and it's all great. And the thing about teachers is, is they don't do anything only a little bit, right? They do it all the way. They put their whole heart into it. And um, they want to give the, their very best to students all the time. So they need time to be able to do this. Um, I always say the parking lot at Wentworth on a Sunday is one of my saddest places because there are so many cars there and they're just, you know, they work really, really hard. Um, so, and then the other piece is time before the school year begins to review records and prepare their classrooms. Um, as Todd will attest to, Wentworth is in use all summer long. And then he comes in in the 11th hour to try to clean and teachers are banging down the doors, please let me into my classroom. I need to set up for the kids because they want it to be perfect and they want to be really ready for the kids. And it's it's noble, and I respect that, but they need time to be able to do that and to prepare. And then the last thing that I just sort of sneaked in there under time is supporting um, an unmet need that was sort of a collaboration between curriculum and facilities for um, a position t for a garden facilitator. And that person would um, support teachers with garden integration. Right now, um, if teachers are interested and comfortable with accessing the garden, then their classes are out there all the time. If they're less comfortable, it's less likely that they're spending a lot of time in that really incredible learning lab that we've created at Wentworth. So um, that's an unmet need and, and a hope and a dream and a wish for some time down the road, but um, something that I think will just continue to support a return on investment that we've, this community has made. <coughs> Next up, Diane, Dr. Diane Netto from the middle school. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, starting with our investments, successes, and fast facts, we're very excited at the middle school this year um, to think about all of our STEM investments and how much um, our STEM programming is undergoing change at the current time. So we've been pretty fortunate this year. We got a $2,000 grant from Pharma, um, Manufacturers of America. We also uh, had a teacher write an SEF grant for almost $5,000. Both of those really went towards completely rehabbing our robotics um, programming at the middle school. And I'm really excited to report that um, we have been able to rehab both of those programs so that as we move forward, every student in their tech and engineering classes are going to get a robotics component as, as a core part of that programming. Um, and so that 
really just <coughs> speaks a lot. We've got kids who are very excited. I know when um, I first started here, it was great to see the robotics camps that were happening over the summer, and then it was like, oh, then the school year started, and we didn't have the materials to, to offer that to every student, and so I think that will be a huge win. We were also really excited in this year's budget, we were able to add eighth grade music classes. That was at no cost because of some attrition that we experienced. And so, uh, whereas last year, our eighth graders either had band or they had a flex period, now eighth graders can choose band or general music classes. And Mr. Bizib has done an incredible job really trying to hone in on what we know about our eighth grade students and their interest. And so they're really digging into songwriting and um, making sure that student interest is there. So really excited about that creativity piece. Um, also want to give a plug for our increased world language programming, despite the loss of one of our world language teachers because of attrition, we were able to kind of uh, take another look at what our programming looked like. And now, beginning this year, our students are able to select a language that they will study over three years. So last year, for example, sixth graders got <coughs> a mixed <coughs> bag of both Spanish and French, and so it was really just that introductory, which is now happening at Wentworth. And so as our students are coming in as sixth graders, um, we've been able to double the amount of time that they're getting, because before it was once in a four-day rotation, now it's twice. And also students are starting in that language of their choice as sixth graders. And so even just in this first year, our world language teachers have noticed that um, our sixth graders are really surpassing the skill level in some cases of some of our seventh graders. Because last spring, we had kind of piloted some of this work with Wentworth even before we had made that shift. So those are hugely exciting things that are happening that the district didn't have to pay any extra money for any of those. So that's really great. As we think about this year's budget, knowing um, what the, scape, the landscape looked like across the rest of the district, we really wanted to be mindful of that. Um, but this budget has allowed us to maintain current levels of programming and class sizes for the coming year. Um, we have been able to, again, take another look at what do we provide for services, what do we have for staffing, and we've been able to pare down our uh, one of our wellness teachers to a half-time position based on programming needs. This really comes at a great time for us because it, it doesn't affect any real person's job. We have one person who is retiring, and so this is a great time for us to take a look at what is our what are our programming needs and what are our staffing needs? Um, and then the other really exciting piece that we're looking forward to is um, our budget looks at um, funding an academic center teacher at no new cost. We currently have an academic center ed tech who works with our bridge teacher. Um, if you don't know about what the academic center does at the middle school, we have two staff. One is a teacher, one is an ed tech. Um, our bridge teacher really wor works to support students who are either, one, new to Scarborough when we're assessing their skills and trying to beef those up a little bit so that they'll be ready for our programming. And the other important task that she does is when we have students who are out for extended absences for a number of reasons, medical and otherwise, um, when they come back to school, again, Mrs. Colton will work with those students to make sure that she's keeping them up with their classes. There's an academic center ed tech who works along with her. Her job is really to work with students who have identified executive functioning deficits and to really help them with some of those organizational and study skills. 
that is a, a great thing that she provides. Um, although as we look at the current needs of our school, we also have some huge needs, I hear a theme here, in social emotional um, needs that our students are demonstrating. Um, if we look at the students that are currently being served in the academic center, 30% of them are really coming with those social emotional needs. And so what, what we're looking to do, again, at no new cost, because we've been able to experience attrition in, um, in our wellness, and then we also already have an ed tech in that program that we would just get, we would just make that into a teaching position. So for no new money, we would be able to really focus on about 60 kids a semester who we are identifying as um, kiddos who have weaker connections to the school community, who are experiencing greater amounts of stress or might need more physical opportunities and trying to help them to really feel more acclimated and have an opportunity to build some of those skills. And so we have the opportunity to benefit another 120 of our students who currently we are taking on on a case-by-case -case basis, looking at each other saying, what Band-Aid can we apply here? What can we do for this kid? What can we do for this kiddo? And so to have somebody whose work would really be focused on those students, we feel would be an added benefit, especially as, again, our community in Scarborough is become increasingly diverse in ways that um, a lot of our staff have not experienced. And so we want to make sure that we're providing the support for our students and then also the support for um, teachers so that as students are coming to their classes, we're filling those gaps and helping them um, to feel more connected to our community. Unmet needs, surprise. Um, our unmet need is really um, that ongoing need to address the safety concerns of the sixth grade trailer. Um, approximately, probably a little bit less than this, but about 220 students are receiving core instruction in our, in our sixth grade learning community every day. Um, we do the best that we can. Kids walk back and forth between the sixth grade trailer, I hate using that word, and um, in our main building to access programming throughout their day. Uh, we literally have one of our secretaries in the main office whose primary job is to watch the cameras so that she's seeing as students are leaving one, one building and going to the other, locking and unlocking the doors for them just to ensure that we have student safety. Um, other issues that come up, of course, are weather-related. Um, I think our students grow a really thick skin, uh, especially in the wintertime, because most of them don't even wear coats walking back and forth. Sorry, parents. <laughs> <laughs> not because we're telling them not to. Um, they don't wear and, coats, period. <laughs> right, I know. And, um, and in some cases, we have to do a hold in place when we have a thunderstorm or a huge rainstorm. Sometimes we have to just hold kids where they are because we're not going to let them outside if we don't think the weather conditions are safe for them to travel. And as most of you already know, uh, we continue to do renovation <coughs> applications. We were in the last round in December 2017, and I think out of 70 schools, we rated somewhere around number 50. So, um, you know, there is no help coming from on high at any time soon. Kind of stinks ending on a bad note. I think we should have started with the unmet things and then really like get excited about what we're doing well. It sure does. Okay, so we, you should be jotting as we go. We're gonna go right through to hearing from the high school before we go into questions, just because again, we have that abbreviated time today. And so with that, I turn it over to the high school principal, Susan Ketch. Thank you. 
While we were on break, I put an addendum um, in front of all of you, and my suggestion would be that you put it in the budget book following page 43. So we're going to begin um, talking about some highlights, although I'm not going to spend a ton of time here because I'd like to talk about new initiatives. But in talking about success, we have a lot of good things to talk about. One is that we built, we were approved by NEASC um, in, at the end of June, and um, that we have two building goals this year for the teachers that are really focused on the NEASC result. Um, and I'm really proud of that. One is curriculum work. Um, Monique and her team put a new curriculum document together, and we are committed to getting unit descriptions, standards, and the learning goals into that document for all of our courses this year. And the other building goal um, <clears throat> is around the improvement cycle for grading and reporting, and good work is happening there. We are meeting with the policy committee next week, and um, I really feel that we will have completed that work by the end of the year, and that's very exciting. For advanced learning, um, USM, we have teamed up with USM for Project Aspire, and this year we have Calculus 1 and Calculus 2 students that are doing a dual enrollment piece with USM and Scarborough High School. And for this fall, we hope to add statistics. We're planning to add statistics as another opportunity there. And this year we have 16 students enrolled in Project Aspire. For advanced placement, I always think it is great to remind people that we offer 19 advanced placement courses at the high school, and this year we have about 40 sections running in those 19 courses. So we have a lot of stellar students who are working really hard, hard many at the college level. Um, but not to leave just the students in the limelight, I also wanted to mention that Scarborough partners with USM on an educational cohort for master's and CAS work. The district has done that teamwork, um, that cohort for a little over a decade now, and Scarborough High School has not ever been involved with teachers being a part of that cohort. And so we really worked on that as a team this year with the building, and I'm really pleased to say that this spring we had nine faculty members um, start that cohort work this year. So I'm really pleased that we jumped in in a big way. So um, those are some of my um, successes. Um, just quickly, Alted did an empty bowl project. They had a ceramics class this fall. We had an empty bowl luncheon the last day of school before the December break. They raised $1,200, which they gave to Project Race, which I'm so proud of them. And Mr. Byther's STEM class, um, got donated bicycles, refurbished them, auctioned them off, and they donated that money to Operation Hope. So we've just, um, lots of great things for success. I do want to um, focus now on what we're asking for in budget requests. Um, I would say the theme of this, these requests are that we've been doing work in this area and really um, we've, we've been on a path with this and we've hit a critical point this year where we really need um, a little bit of extra support to keep our momentum going. So the first um, piece I want to talk about is a STEM engineering teacher. And I um, wanted to just remind people that um, the state of Maine is working to attract young people with the Opportunity Maine tax credit. They're really looking for um, young, young people in the field to go into STEM kinds of opportunities. Um, we have been developing this program for um, about five years now. In 2014-15, we offered one course in STEM engineering. And this year, in 2018-19, we've grown to eight. Um, this is something that the high school feels very strongly. K through eight has been doing amazing, amazing work in STEM. They have... Um, focused teachers that are really working to grow this program. And at the high school level, we're really feeling strongly that we need a good platform that those middle schoolers, when they are excited and advanced, that we are really to pick them up and put them on a new level um, at the high school. 
And we've been doing this work for a few years, not only with our tech teachers, but we've been robbing Peter to pay Paul with math and science teachers taking a period out of what they've normally taught to be offering some of these aid opportunities. Um, this year, I think we have six um, courses in STEM being taught by math and science, one math period and five science. Um, part of our challenge now is we're tapping out in the science classes. We weren't able to offer um, as many sections of some of our standard biology, chemistry, physics courses because we had them teaching STEM. So our request here is to um, get, get someone focused on teaching that and then we can get our science teachers back to covering some more of those sections that are needed. Um, we've not only been working on this, at first we kind of started with some general work to see where the interest was. This year, if you look at your handouts, we really are starting a Pathways program. And um, we have two teachers, uh, Mr. McHugh and Ms. Joyner, that received a grant and are going to go to code.org school this summer. And we're going to be teaching some introduction survey courses for the first time. Introduction to Computer Science and Coding 1, um, Intro to Engineering, and Intro to Business as initial survey courses where they would start on a pathway um, for those courses. Um, I also just wanted to note in the need area that last year's sign-ups for this current school year, we had five more courses worth of interest in students than we were able to provide them in actual courses. So we had five um, sections of things that had we had teachers to offer it, we had student interest in that. And um, that we are um, moving some of those science and math teachers around and that's um, starting to get a little pushback that we don't have enough science and math offerings um, to fill the need in those courses as well. Um, the second piece for me is to talk about the Career Pathways and Internship. Again, a program that we've been developing for years. We're in the second spring of a pilot with our internships where Christy Zavasnik has worked to um, place 15 students. Um, every other school day, they go for a double block. Um, they will put in over 90 hours this semester in their internship. That has been a great program. Christy has also started some career talks this year. She has many um, ideas on ways to grow that. Next month, um, some of our students will go to a Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, and Scarborough coordinated career fair. Um, and what we are really looking to do is develop a career pathways program that would um, have one-shot deals, like a career talk in the library during a period where they could talk to someone that works as an engineer and how did you get from high school to where you are now, to some job shadowing, some sort of middle ground opportunities, to all the way to the internship, which we call sort of leave to learn um, opportunities. And we're, while we have science uh, Spanish teachers that have taken over some larger numbers in their classes to give Christy some time to work on this, again, we're at a critical point in furthering the development in that we need now to ask for some personnel. The social worker, um, Allison has, um, really well spoken about that, but I do want to say that we really have had um, more and more students coming to our student services department talking about stress, anxiety, depression. Um, in fact, in November, our student council had a student meeting. Um, they called it a town meeting where they just had asked for kids to come and tell them what they wanted to be heard. They met with the BLT team um, in early December and what they spoke most about was worry for friends about stress, anxiety, and depression. And asked, um, they had a couple of ideas of things that needed to be done and we worked on that diligently before break and in January we ran class meetings um, the entire student services department met with each grade to talk to them about 
what the different jobs were, what a guidance counselor can help you with, what social work can help you with, how to get connected, not to be afraid to um, contact them and um, work with them. And then also we started during our AE's time, 35 minutes in the morning on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, we now have an opportunity with three of our faculty have volunteered one day a week to do mindfulness activities and yoga activities with them. So if students are caught up on their homework and they want to get a pass and go down and learn some skills on how to balance the stress in their life, we're doing that um, three days a week as well. So that need for a social worker, we are certainly um, hearing that from our students. And so that's a piece that I really want to um, say student voice has been very important in that ask. And then our final slide is um, just on the unmet needs. And um, last year we did cut an English teacher. Um, and what's happened there is that we have lost some of our electives in English that we would like to be offering, but just can't at this time. We have been talking about an RTI specialist to combat some of the 504 absenteeism, some of those student needs, and we um, have put that on the back burner. And the last request is our dance teacher teaches one section each semester, and we had students again this fall um, coming to guidance and asking if there could be a dance too. Could we, could we expand that program? And that is um, on our unmet need. However, I did mention this at a board meeting. We will look at sign up. And if we have enough to run a dance one class and we have enough students in a dance two, we may shift from teaching two dance ones to one of each. We will look at what the student request is and try to best meet that need. Thank you. <clears throat> Kathy, as our facilitator timekeeper here, has made some adjustments to the agenda so that we stay on time because we do need to leave right at 5.30 so they can set up for the 6 o'clock. So we'll adjust five minutes for reviewing next steps and five minutes for um, pluses and deltas at the end so we can answer your questions. We We've heard... Need to, uh, questions go until 5 o'clock and then we need to start our credit long walk. see one here, two there, three. So Amy and Alicia, I, I'm just wondering about the, the class size impact with the, having needing to pull math and science teachers to cover some of the STEM offerings that are crucial um, in terms of being offered. And all, similarly, perhaps with Christy's position, um, Spanish classes, the, the impact on class size that had, because obviously, there's, I mean, they're not doing what they are normally doing. So in science particularly, um, this year we really did have some cases where we sh maybe could have offered another biology three course and shared those, spread the numbers out a little bit. We're, we're like I've said, we've, we've kind of maxed those opportunities and we're kind of at a critical point where that's going to start being a concern. I know that late fall as we had new students registering kind of passed our normal window of kids joining us, um, there were some concerns for a bit. And in a couple of cases, we had to go to the teacher and ask if they would take one more than what the class size usually is. And we were able to accommodate that. But we see that we are kind of on the edge there. Um, sec what was the second part? In what? Oh, foreign language. Um, what we see in foreign language, especially in Spanish, is that our earlier courses, Spanish 1, Spanish 2, are larger enrollment, not quite as much in Spanish 3 and 4. The numbers aren't quite as big an issue. But again, we've, we've eliminated two sections of Spanish. And you can see in the Spanish 1 especially that our numbers are elevated there in, in the um, 22 to 24 range in each of those classes. So we are seeing some effect of that. Wrong to use my questions for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> for folks that are watching it, <laughs> sorry. Um, I noticed at the middle school the enrollment will be up next year, but there's three fewer teachers. What does that? What is the impact to the class size for you? So there are not three fewer teachers for next year. That is like you're comparing FY18 to FY19. 
like, right? So FY20, our plan is to keep the exact same number. So isn't that a great answer? That's awesome answer. <laughs> Pass it to Alicia. So um, my first question is for Kelly. The, we've got 2017 through 2020 data here, and I noticed that we go from zero to whatever's proposed for the co-curricular. And I was wondering if you could explain why it was zero in 2017, and now it's funded. Do you want that one? You want Kate to? Probably Kate. Okay. <laughs> um, Alicia, I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for. Looking at, are you looking in the um, the line items? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, the answer to that is that for the prior years, prior to that first year that you're seeing. We actually had the co-curriculars for Wentworth in the instructional lines. They were in an instructional stipend line. And we recognized that they were growing and that the clubs were getting bigger and that the stipends were getting more um, significant. And we realized that they really belonged in, in co-curricular as far as a budget category was concerned. So the, the clubs have not changed. The funding hasn't changed except for incremental growth. But their location in the budget has changed. Um, so if you were to look back to that prior year, you would see a much higher stipend line in Wentworth instructional budget. Okay, thank you. Another question, Alicia? Yes, thank you. This, this may be a key question to the instructional contracted services. What is that and why is there such a big discrepancy in the different schools for the... Um, the percentage of change between last year and this year? I, I think, thank you for bringing this up because one of the things that I wanted to talk about with the Finance Committee was the difference in line items and the fact that we have 600 different line items means that percent changes can be kind of um, peculiar to figure out. You might have you know one person or one item in a line and so if that if you add a second person to that line, all of a sudden it's doubled. So um, there are some things that we'll, we'll walk through in finance to talk about the, the nitty gritty on those line items. Um, but the, the difference in instructional um, contracted services, usually what that means is some form of either a software or an outside service that's being provided to the schools um, uh, on the instructional side. So, uh, for example, a subscription or a type of um, curriculum piece that has an online component to it may show up in the instructional contracted services as opposed to showing up in the textbooks. And we do go back and forth every year with the building leaders um, on the subject of if a textbook comes with an online component, is it still a textbook? Does it belong in the online services line? Uh, but typically what you're seeing in those contracted services line, there's some so sort of software that's being used in the building. And we can dig a little bit deeper into the specifics of that as well. Any other questions for our principals? Wow, you guys did such a great job to answer all the questions. Any questions that went unanswered earlier? <coughs> Um, I had a question that I wanted to ask um, Allison because, um, and, and, well, it's okay, but, um, and maybe the K2 teachers too, but um, so we keep talking about um, the fact that we have a lot of pre-registered kindergartners more than we anticipated and that a very high number of those have incoming, we, we have already identified um, to have incoming needs or, or, or are on IEPs. And I just wanted to ask you, what is the typical percentage of students that are not identified that then become identified in kindergarten? So like how many, or can you estimate the number that we will have in addition to the ones we have already identified? <coughs> 
I'd actually have to go back and really tease out the data to get a percent and a projection, but I can tell you as of January of this year, uh, we had newly identified six kindergarten students. In addition to anyone who was? Came in. Yes. Okay. But sometimes the students are also exited in kindergarten. So um, we have a number of students <coughs> who come in with like speech and language um, IEPs and sometimes those are exited as well. So it's not necessarily that we're adding, we're always adding. And I would say that there's also the under-identified kiddo who comes in with a speech and language um, diagnosis but may actually have something far more significant that just okay. is, you know, maybe autism, but it's just not teased out by the time they're four years old. So, okay. so there's that too. Yes. Thank you. And at, at different de developmental stages, students also can become identified. So obviously, it, yeah. it just depends on sometimes a student can look like they're developing typically, and then we learn in third or fourth grade that there's a specific learning disability that's impacting their ability mm -hmm. to make progress or be on <coughs> Any other questions that you have? Okay. Hearing none, I think we just got ourselves a couple of minutes there. We'll move on to the next. I think we're. Oh, nope, that's a, that's an illusion. Let me just update this. <laughs> Sorry to tease you with that. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Kathy to explain what we're going to do in the next part here of our agenda. Okay, we're gonna work on our talking points, and I, I don't know if the, if you have the um, presentation up, you can actually get on the document if you want to. Julie, can you go to the document? <coughs> And we can certainly add any heading, but last year when we put together, we just brainstormed some ideas of what is the aim of this budget, what's the maintenance budget, pluses, drivers, and what are you voting for? I just started to type in from the items that are in the budget now. We can reword these. And Ed was our note taker today. We failed to mention that at the beginning of the meeting. So he'll help us capture these points. So the idea behind this is now already, actually, starting yesterday, people were watching our budget presentation and already weighing in and asking questions. And what we want to ensure is that you have um, some critical talking points that you can sort of stick in your virtual or actual back pocket so that as community members approach you, you can sound really informed and you can be really articulate about what's in and out of this budget. So the aim of the budget, um, Kate and I actually took a stab at defining this for our presentation tomorrow night, but we'd like you all to weigh in if you have, um, now that you've heard sort of the critical components. And it really isn't a maintenance bu budget this year. Last year, we, we were bare bones. We trimmed as far as we could trim. Um, and it really was a nice budget, but you still heard of all the things that we added, right, in terms of reallocation and looking for efficiencies, which is a critical part of our budget process. So I don't think that that header actually even is applies to us this year, the maintenance budget piece of it, um, because we do have some new asks. Maybe I would reword that, Kathy, to say um, impact of growth. Uh, that's something that's really significant in this budget. So what's sort of sticking out to you or something that you feel we need to be articulating to the community? I, I think that um, bottom line, uh, this budget is really addressing the growth in town. Mm -hmm. I would say response to growth. And I, I, just, I just feel like we really need to, to pound that drum and, and give that message to the community that we are, we are addressing the school needs of this community due to the growth that's happening in town. This is not a fluffy budget. I, I really am hard pressed to even look at where we could take anything out. Um, I'll be asking to add unified basketball in, quite frankly. So I, I think that, I mean, the, the aim of the budget is to address 
the growth and, and maintain the quality programs that we've had and, and maybe the, some of the gains that we, that we have made, in, you know, incremental gains, but the few we have. The STEM point, I think, is crucial, K through eight. You know, I mean, how, how do you have a really robust K through eight STEM program and then have kids get to the high school four years away from going to college to potentially study STEM and not have any opportunities for them? Amen to that. <coughs> so one thing I'll bring your attention to, um, inside your binders, I believe Kate slipped in um, this beautiful tool, which <coughs> is my favorite budget communication tool that we have. And what I'd ask you to do is just turn a couple of pages in. So everything you heard our principals um, talk about today that's in their budget is included above the red line that you see on page four. And so this is, this draws the, the bottom line, if you will, for our budget proposal. And the way we think about this red line is everything above it, we wanted to highlight to, as part of the conversation. So we're gonna dig really, really deep with all of these things. But as Amy pointed out, unified basketball is not currently above that red line, but anything is fair game to go above that red line or come out of that red line. Mm -hmm. So um, this would be a great place to be jotting notes as we're talking about some of these things too. We should have that in the like format where it falls down on one page. <laughs> Tomorrow night, there'll be the slide deck. Uh, one of the talking points, uh, points that stood out to me is, is really the importance of investing in our physical plant and, and in our <coughs> maintenance. But, I mean, um, I think we've talked about it at a few different ma meetings now, but the state standard typically is that you would invest 3% of the overall value of your physical plant annually, which if you do the math is about $3 million. We've always been orders of magnitude below that, and we're trying to rise up a little bit closer to that mark, but we're barely over the halfway with this budget proposal. And so I think mm -hmm. hammering that down, the importance of investing in our structures so that they have the longevity. Uh, one of the things I say <laughs> at the college all the time is just because something's made of brick doesn't make it in, uh, last forever. And so there's always maintenance that has to be put in. And so that's one of the things that stands out to me that we have to champion is the importance of this investment. Did you capture that answer? Anywhere. Sure you know. Where does it make the physical plant? There we go. So in terms of aim of budget, I think addresses growth, um, <laughs> addresses the needs of our facilities, and then I would add um, addresses the or responds to changing in student needs. And we, we have students coming in with with needs like never before, and you know even at every phase level, we need to adjust our 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 staff and our curriculum and, and do really great work to serve these students. And so I think this kind of the third aim I would like to add would be addresses changes changes in student needs. Uh, I completely agree with all that. I would kind of want to be a stickler and say that it, it only begins yeah. to address the needs. Um, so to add that clarification in there, um, one of the things that I've been learning that um, I think is unfair is the way that we build our budget around this 3% figure that has just been out there uh, for years and years and um, something maybe we'll, we'll look to change in the future, but for right now that, that is the way it is and that's how we're building it. Um, but I think it's important to say that this certainly doesn't meet the needs and that we're just beginning to. And could you capture that on your driver, the 3% tax rate goal? It's a driver and not it really means that we're able to question, maybe a comment, and I don't want to put anyone on the spot because so, I don't know if this is an appropriate question. Um, the unified basketball thing is something that's really been sticking with me as well. It it's, makes me a little sick to my stomach when I think about it. Um, and I, I agree with Amy's comment. I think we all would agree that we'd like to get that in the budget. Uh, the unfortunate reality is, is it's, it's something going to have to fall out for that to go in. Um, and I guess I don't know if there are, those of you who are on the table, if there are things on the investment list that you would look at to say, maybe not that in place of getting unified basketball. Like where, instead of 
uh, leaving us to our own devices to sort of make those calls. Uh, I don't. I would like to hear from you, if not now, in future finance committee meetings. Maybe if there are things, w ways, um, ways that we can trim other areas in order to get something like that in. I'll speak a little bit to that. Tyler Palisade Kate could add to it. Um, I think, again, the important thing to remember, and we'll have to remind our community of this over and over again, is that this starts the conversation. And so this is still very fluid, right? Um, we originally had unified basketball, if you remember, um, in the required services, because we deeply believe, I think the collective way, that opportunities like this are essential if we're going to realize our mission, which is to ensure that every, each and every student has full access, right? Um, with that being said, as soon as we create our budget, it almost immediately becomes irrelevant because new information comes in and new ideas start happening. Um, and so I know Mike Legage, along with Allison Marchese um, and others, are thinking of some creative ways that we can fund unified basketball. And there are some community members that are weighing in that maybe we're projecting too high the cost of, of doing it. Um, but it's different than at the middle school because it really is, um, it, it requires they have a full season, it's not just three games, they have a championship, and so it does require a, a few more um, ingredients, if you will, to make the program successful. But with that being said, um, our director of athletics has been reaching out to families and parents who are also passionate about unified basketball, like us, to think about ways that we can either create a booster group, which we don't think is the best way to move forward. We think if we value it, we should own it and fund it, um, as we do with all of our activities. Um, but we're also, so we're looking at grant opportunities, we're looking at that as a possibility, and I believe that Allison has a meeting scheduled next week with Mike Legage, a parent, and someone from Special Olympics to think of some other creative ways to source that. Um, did you want to add to that in any way? <laughs> no, other than I think we need to look at a blended approach to bring this forward instead of an all or nothing budget line. Thank you for saying that, Allison. I really appreciate that comment, Allison. That would be, be my request. If we can't fully fund it, I think it needs to be partially funded in this budget. And then can we be creative in how we fund the rest? I mean, I, I think of this as an incredible opportunity for our booster groups for other sports to make each make a donation to the programs. And then maybe reach out to, to SEF and have it be a partnership and a collaboration to get this off the ground next year. I think if we're creative, we can make this happen, but I do think it needs to be partially funded through this budget so we can start to have that record that we're supporting this program moving forward. Those are great ideas. I think Sarah had some ideas about tapping into alumni, too. Um, I think it's also a good idea. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. And administrators, certainly you're a part of this conversation, so feel free to weigh in. So mine is mine's less of a question than a comment, and I will put people on the spot, unlike Sarah. Uh, <laughs> as a member of the Finance Committee, I think um, Sarah and Melissa and I have had a little more insight into <coughs> the Leadership Council's development of the budget and the setting of the priorities. But for the rest of the board, I think it would be really valuable, and for the community for that matter, to hear um, from some of you um, how the process works and you know when you all present your proposals, like what kind of discussion happens and, and kind of how you all establish your priorities for us so that to give it some context. So I'll ask for volunteers. <laughs> Who'd like to field that one? <laughs> of course I talk about it for days, so there you go. <clears throat> I'm never shy. Um, I think that <laughs> I think that it's it's important to know that you know this is not the only time we meet. We meet right. together all year long, every week, and so we have a, a, a good solid foundation of a, rate, a relationship with each other and know what the strengths and and challenges we're each facing at each of our levels. Um, so when it comes to budget time and we hear things. Um, we do want to be supportive of K-12. I think we all try to maintain a big picture viewpoint of this and not just about our own level. Yes, we advocate for for our level, but we also appreciate what what other people are are, are doing and, and having having to cut or not cut. Um, and it's hard. It's emotional. We 
I don't think we get mad at each other ever, but we, we know it's a, an emotional process and we want to give everybody everything that they need just like you all do. You know, we want all students to have what they need at all levels and not have to pick and choose. But one of the things I think um, that was really um, different this year for, for me anyway was hearing Central Office's story of 500 employees and no HR director and how the town has HR for fewer employees and how most companies have an HR department for 500 employees, not just one person, but departments of people. And how ridiculous that is that there's an organization this big that doesn't have that kind of support. And you know, we are so fortunate that Kate and Rhonda know and Monique and jo Julie and Joanne and Allison and Chris all know most of our employees by first name. When you say, I have a problem with, and you say, call Kate or call Rhonda, people know who you mean. And when I call Kate, she's like, oh yeah, I can help them. Tell them to come up at two. And she has been phenomenal. We're so fortunate that we have these incredibly talented and, and brilliant people that can help our staff, but they're not getting something else done when they're helping a, a staff member in crisis. So, you know, that, that's something that's like, we all went, that has to be above the red line. That has to happen. This is something for everybody in the district to feel better about and to feel supported about and to, and to get behind. So that was something for me that was very different this year because central office is sort of like the parent and always puts their needs off, you know, for the children. And, <laughs> and we all do that. But I think that's, that's something that really spoke to me this, this budget cycle. So in terms of the process, the way that it works, we always start first looking at enrollment numbers um, and looking at personnel. And we start like bare, bare bones, if you will, with personnel. We talk about skills and attributes that we look for in every person that we hire. And we bring ourselves through that process the last few years um, specifically so that when we think about who are we going to grow and who maybe is it time to let go, um, that's part of that conversation because we know that's our most valuable resource. Um, so it always starts there, and then we start looking at well, what are the enrollment projections? You know, is the middle school going to need more or less teachers? Is, are the K-2s going to need more or less teachers? High school, it's much more complex because it's really driven by the students, but we look at all the class sizes at the high school level too, and we look at the course offerings. Are we offering rigorous, relevant courses, right? So that's a little bit different. It's very mathematical at the primary grades, um, but all of that, that's the initial, and that's like November, early December conversation. And then from there, we start, the principals and the directors start putting in budget proposals. And these are written documents where they say, here's my need, here's how I justify it, here's my idea about how it could be funded. So sometimes, like in Diane's um, case, she was like, I think through reallocation and attrition, I can fund this position at a net neutral, at a budget neutral cost. Um, in the high school situation, that wasn't the situation, right? They need to ask for additional funding in order to make this happen. So that's the next part. And we talk about every single one of those. This year we had, I don't know, we had a lot of, a lot of new proposals because we've been so lean over the last three years. Um, and then each individual, so as Sue's presenting for the high school, she says this is a high priority or a medium priority or a low priority. And they're all priorities or else they wouldn't take time to write proposals. But we use that to kind of think, High priority, and actually there's a fourth column that's required, like non-negotiable, which is where our special ed stuff goes, right? Um, so then they're rating it, not because it's not a priority, obviously. They took the time to write the proposal, but they're saying, like, high priority, it has to happen this year. Medium priority, I'd like it to happen this year, but it's going to be a need. You're going to hear me talking about this. And low priority is sort of what Allison did with, like, the CDS saying, we need to start this conversation so our community's ready when we have the ask, when it becomes the required or the high priority ask. And so they all rank their things. And it's hard because they usually all end up in the high priority category. <laughs> or at least right? <laughs> again. <laughs> and then after they hear each other and each principal or director presents their proposals and prioritizes them, then we say, okay, now we see the needs K-12. Everything can't be a high priority. So we have that tough discussion that um, Anne talked about. And then from there, it goes back to the central office leadership team, which is like your executive leadership. Um, and we listen to all of the inputs from all of the principals and the teachers, and we say, okay, what's, what's, what's realistic? 
And then we bring it back to the Leadership Council and you know, don't usually win any fan favorites on that day because we've probably trimmed it even further or reprioritized things slightly. But we explain that and we have dialogue around that. Um, and then while that's happening, uh, Kate, myself, Joanne, and Monique are meeting individually with every single principal or director who's responsible for creating a budget, and we go line by line through their budget. And we say, this is what you asked for last year, and that's what it was approved in FY19. This is what you've spent to date in this line item. What is it that you're asking for next year, and where's your evidence that you need that? Right? And so we, and that takes hours. I mean, we schedule two hours with each principal <laughs> and director. Sometimes we schedule a second meeting depending upon what it is we're talking about. That's also a chance for us as um, the central office leaders who are in that conversation to help principals further understand, well, here's what's happening at each of the phase levels, or here's how we're trying to eliminate some disproportionality or create proportionality. Um, so there's that part of the process all before we even get to you know, what you're hearing today. And that's the hundreds of hours that Kate talked about yesterday. Would you add more to the process, guys? <coughs> Anything else you want to make sure we capture on this talking point sheet? I think one of the pieces that we really need to hammer home is the importance of the Greatest Tobago Alliance. Because if that does not pass, these numbers are in flux mm -hmm. because there's cost savings, there's opportunities for you know, partnerships that we're not going to have without this, and we really need to bring that home. Mm -hmm. And on the bottom line, you're going to see this tomorrow night and tonight in the items in motion, um, but on the bottom line, it's $83, $83,020.80 right away that our budget will be reduced just with a, without uh, a yes vote or an affirmative vote. I was just going to um, add that maybe in the aim of the budget, we have a piece about the importance of this um, special services requests and that those are really important requests for students that really, really need that. And to always remember that the more we do for them, the younger we do it, the more benefits they will have their entire lives. And I know that this year that, that piece of the budget looks like a bigger ask than it has in recent years, but it's a really important ask. And for those children and those families, it's a really, really important ask. That's an excellent point. Early intervention is way more cost efficient than intervening later on. And this is why you have this national push for public preschool for all, because we know that it's like the return on investment is like $8 and change compared to every dollar spent if you wait later to bring kids to school later. So that's a really good point, So, What other talking points or ideas are on the top of your mind? I would just say related to um, that growth in town size, I think we need to hammer at that even more and, and show some of those statistics and the numbers around the enrollment projections because I think that we can't share that narrative enough because the community is not just going to hear that story this year. They're going to hear it next year and the year after and the year after that. And so they need to know that this ask in terms of our growing enrollment, in terms of our changing community, is gonna be something that we're going to continue to be talking about. And for every additional ask there is, there's a facilities need. So Sue <coughs> Ketch is asking for a STEM teacher at the high school. There's no STEM space for that teacher. So somehow, They'll have to <laughs> cobble something together. I have ideas. And I'm sure Sue has great ideas. But in order to continue all the great things that Kelly and Diane have talked about with their STEM programs at the lower grade levels, it would only make sense to continue it at the high school level. But it would be unfair to patch together something and give them an inadequate space <laughs> to have that experience. And we all have great ideas. And as I said yesterday, we could... We can do great things with great ideas, but it takes time. We can't just whip together a classroom tomorrow for that 
new STEM teacher. I just I was going to add on to that and just say that um, I feel like we should be specific in how we have to address the growth because it's not just oh there's 20 more kids that's one teacher it's facilities do we have space for that classroom it's setting up that classroom it, you know there's all kinds of things that we have touched on here that um, that are more specific as to how we address that growth so it's I think that's important. Right. Technology, but then also support services, support. like yeah. you know, guidance and social work. I think in terms of um, talking points, something that's maybe a little misunderstood is the impact of our minimum receivership um, status, because it even felt really different for us this year to start building a budget when we weren't trying to climb out of a huge hole of filling a gap. Like we knew where we were to begin. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that is an important piece for the community to understand too. It's obviously not ideal to be a minimum receiver, but at least we knew where we were starting and we weren't filling this huge gap before we even started talking about student needs. I would just add on that because the newspaper article you know, showed how much more Scarborough was getting. Um, even my husband was like, look, look, you guys are getting some money. Uh, but they don't realize really where it's coming from, that the state is still underfunding uh, special education and are raising that from the current 40% to 45%. Uh, still not, I believe, 55% is what we are supposed to be at. So I think it's important for them to add, understand mm -hmm. what that is. Still only six cents on the dollar. Right. I think the other part of that is, yes, we did see a significant increase because we get little money. If you only have a nickel and you add another nickel, it seems like a big percent increase, right? Um, but in reality, the additional 623000 that we received comparative to last year was solely because they went from funding 40% of your special ed costs to 45%. We're still only receiving $3.3 .3 million on a 47, almost $48 million budget. So I agree with Hillary that I'd love to have the numbers for the specific impact of growth mm -hmm. just for this year um, and be able to talk about that more so that people understand. But I also want to just focus on some of the negatives with this budget that we're just not anywhere near w getting what we need to get in this budget. And I think that, um, you know, the con a lot of the conversations I have with people is are around... Um, the spending and how much it is, but the reality is, you know, the facilities, we're trying to manage the growth and we're trying to replace leaky windows or le rusty doors. We, 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 I mean, we're trying to, maybe we can add a, a teacher position that we need, but we're trying to manipulate the classrooms in which they can operate because we just don't have what we need. And so, there are so many examples of that, and I just want us to be able to really clearly articulate it, that our facilities are, are not sufficient, that there are many old facilities that, and we're just trying to maintain them, and we're not even funding that anywhere, as Nick said, just a, a little bit more than half of what is recommended. And so at some point we need to either replace the facilities or increase the amount that we're spending on, on, on <laughs> fixing them. Mm -hmm. So two points I would make. One, if we want to talk about staff morale, one of the things that is really detrimental to staff morale, the staff in this room, but also our teachers and our, our people in the buildings, is this constant narrative each year that we're like fighting for minimum financial support in order to do these really big jobs. That wears on you. You want to talk about teacher burnout and principal burnout, administrator burnout, this conversation year after year. I mean, when we went around to the teachers in December, teachers were like, well, we just don't ask because we don't think we can get it. Mm -hmm. And we want to change that narrative. We want you to ask every time. The answer still might be no, not yet, but we at least need to know so that we can advocate for that. But that has, that has a long-lasting impact on the, on the morale of the district. So we have to be mindful of the psychological impact of this battle each year that we undergo as a community and really decide what kind of community are we going to be. 
Um, if you look at other communities around us that some folks in our town may or may not aspire to, this isn't, this isn't a fight every year. Um, it's they want to fund their schools and they're adding p critical positions because their people, their experts in the school, they're telling them they need it. Um, and if the conversation comes up, up to you guys, two, two things I would um, want to highlight, and Kate and I are thinking about the best way to incorporate this. Those of you on the finance committee, it was in your red folder, um, this pink and blue chart. But this shows over time what has our net spending. So we have our gross, which is our expenditures, and then we have our net, which recalculates based on the revenue that we generate. Although small, it still adjusts the number. So when we, Kate did an analysis all the way back from FY10 to current day. And when we look at what is the net increase in expenditure, this proposed budget that's before you right now is 5.7% net increase over last year. Uh, the average, the 11 year average is 6.81%. Mm. So anyone tries to tell you this budget's out of control, this spending's out of control, I would say that's not what the evidence says. I would also add that in the last three years, um, at least the last two years, we are lower in terms of net ask on our budget. So in FY19, it was 5.93%. In FY18, it was 6.22%. Again, this year, our net ask is 5.7%. Um, it's been as high as 9.96% back in FY13, and that was coming off of three tight years. FY10, when the recession hit, we actually had a negative net increase because we laid off 40-some teachers, um, or rift 40-some teachers. And then we incrementally invested in FY11 at 4.7%, incrementally in FY12 at 3.9%, and then you have a big bulge year of 9.96%. We want to avoid that. We want to be incrementally investing, being fiscally responsible so that we can have a sustainable tax rate increase and so that we can continue to grow our schools and not have to constantly dig a hole to get by for a few years and then backfill that hole, kind of what Kelly was describing to you. Nothing about that feels good to the people who are putting in the 60, 70 hours a week to serve our kids. So again, this year we're asking, our net ask is 5.7. It's not supposed to be 3%. The goal is tax rate 3%, not net school ask, right? <coughs> Let's not confuse that. And the 11 year average is 6.81%. So I say, I make the claim that this is a fiscally responsible budget and there are critical services that are included that we have to advocate for. Actually, I think you guys were before I was. Oh, no, I was just gonna they say, were, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last thing I'd ask for, I know, Hillary, you have one of these. Julie, you've had it. If we can all have or be able to pass around the nice chart that the Jamie Ball Walmart chart. Mm -hmm. oh, I have it because right here. I think that is one of the most powerful visuals when we're out and talking to the community of everything that the government is requiring mm -hmm. for the teachers to do. I literally carry it around with me. This is incredible. And I really think that this tells the story mm -hmm. and it helps to back in that this is a responsible budget for everything that has to be accomplished. In the first um, bullet where it says aim for the budget, one of the uh, statistics that Todd and I were talking about about two months ago is all the different projects in town. But come September, there will be 400, over 400 new apartments. That didn't include any homes. It was 400 apartments that are going to be opened and ready in the town of Scarborough. Hopefully all one bedrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Studio. Okay, anyone want the final word before we wrap up? Uh, all right, final word, Sarah, well, chair of finance. Say, that's bold. Sarah, that's uh, no, I just want to say thank you to everyone for putting so much effort into this. Um, it's clear how many hours go into it, so really appreciate it. You've made our jobs a lot easier. Yes. Yes. Anne, do you want to ask for a motion? Oh, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thanks for everybody. Okay, you guys. When we go upstairs, we have to look at this idea.